life at these elevations is existing on the fringe. It's hard to believe that life could even persist here, let alone thrive beautifully. Join me on today's expedition as we find out just how they do it here on the rooftop of America, the Colorado Rockies. Colorado is America's rooftop. It holds the vast majority of summits over 14,000 feet outside of Alaska, with 53 peaks. These elevations aren't just barren rocky crags, but hold vast areas of verdant alpine tundra, and are home to some of the largest and most charismatic of America's fauna. We begin our exploration in the vast parks. That's a term for valley grasslands. These grasslands are maintained by their fine textured soils and by the browsing and grazing of large animals. Just above the grasslands here on the eastern front is one of the most charismatic of woodlands in the west. As you move up from those parks, those grasslands down below, on hot dry slopes that are open to the sun, you find a really unique type of forest. One that is really characteristic of the West where you have scattered ponderosa pine. This is a ponderosa pine woodland, one of the most amazing habitats that you'll find in the West. Wildlife is everywhere here. All those major large species that migrate up in elevation like the bighorn sheep, the elk, they're all here too at different times of the year. And in this habitat is one of the best places to bird watch in this part of the country. We see violet green swallows. Violet green is very descriptive because of that beautiful coloration of this bird. Bright white, almost clown-like face with a brilliant green cap, green back, and then the lower parts of the wings and the lower part of the tail is this iridescent shining violet when it catches the light. It's probably the most beautiful swallow in North America, maybe the world. And a bird you won't miss is the black-billed magpie. Relative of jays, much larger species though. It makes a lot of noise. Even mountain bluebirds, the bluebird that I feel is the most beautiful of all bluebirds. And we've been watching a pair trading off feeding young at the nest right here. They're cavity nesters, just like all of our bluebirds here in North America. And of course the bird you can't miss, the one that's singing all around us, which is the western tanager, an incredibly beautiful two-tone bird. This bird with this bright orange head, yellow body, but related to the scarlet tanager and the summer tanager we have back home. But also chipmunks, squirrels, all kinds of wildlife in this habitat. And one of the chipmunks that we've seen here, possibly the least chipmunk, we have at least three species that occur in this zone of these mountains. So they're hard to tell apart, but I think the little guys we've been watching here are least chipmunks. Another cute little squirrel that you might mistake for a small prairie dog is the Wyoming ground squirrel. They make the burrows in these beautiful, large grassy areas between the pines. This open structure of this forest, widely scattered trees, is primarily because this is an area that's exposed to fire. And unlike some of the forests higher above us here, these fires that burn through the Ponderosa Pine Forest, they'll kill small trees, but they burn right under the large trees. Beautiful birds, beautiful animals, and you can't miss the plants. An incredible show of wildflowers if you're here in late spring, early summer. The Ponderosa Pine Woodland just doesn't get the respect it deserves. Next time you're here, take some time to explore this habitat. As we move up the mountain in even higher altitudes, here on really droughty, oftentimes south-facing, dry, shallow soils, we enter one of the most characteristic communities of the Rocky Mountains, and that's this. This is lodgepole pine forest, and it's dominated by really a single species of tree. It's not the world's most diverse habitat, but ecologically, it's really cool because fire is absolutely necessary for the reproduction of lodgepole pine forest. Everything about this tree is made to burn. It has branches that hang way down close to the ground, trying to catch fire, really, and push it into the canopy where we get these horrible, huge conflagrations like we saw out in Yellowstone back in the 80s that was reported as destroying thousands upon thousands of acres. What it was doing was regenerating lodgepole pine forest. You see, when the fire burns up into the canopy, it heats up the cones. They pop open, they release seed, and there's no place better for a lodgepole pine to get a start than in the bare mineral soil that's left after a fire. So if you look behind me right here, you'll notice a young stand of even aged lodgepole pines. 
there was probably a small fire that pushed up in here, maybe a decade or two ago, and regenerated the lodgepole pine stand. So we're standing in an older stand, a younger stand here, and you can really kind of tell where fires have burned based upon where the different age stands of lodgepole pine are. Well, it's not that different looking really than a lot of habitats across the Rockies and across much of the U.S. As we move up even further and into slightly moister habitats, you'll find things get even more familiar. As we move higher, you'll notice some of the most characteristic and familiar wildlife. The raucous Stellar's Jay is a western specialist, as is the mountain cottontail, whose small ears and stocky body are great adaptations for the cold climate. The snowshoe hare, by contrast, is widespread and also quite common in the northeast. Along watercourses, if you're patient, you'll encounter the frequently heard but seldom seen Lincoln Sparrow. And if you're lucky, you may even spot the largest of America's deer. When you get into moisture situations along streams, away from those hot, dry, south-facing slopes that are exposed to not just heat and drought, but fire, it looks even more familiar. You would have a hard time telling where I was if you didn't know what tree species these were, because we're essentially in a spruce fir forest. We've got a fir, and in this case, the fir is subalpine fir. It's a Rocky Mountain species, and the highest elevation spruce species in Colorado Engelman spruce. It looks like a balsam fir and a red spruce or a balsam fir and a white spruce, but different species, endemic species, ones that are only found here in the Rocky Mountains, but they're joined by some very familiar plants. One of my favorite plants of this habitat is quaking aspen. That species is called quaking aspen because of the unique architecture of the leaf. It's incredible. It has a flattened petiole. That's what we call the stem to a leaf blade. And this flattened petiole provides some aerodynamic features to it. And then you have this flat blade so that wind can blow through the petiole without too much resistance. And then hits that blade and it starts quaking all over the place. And then nobody's quite sure why quaking aspen has quaking leaves, but you gotta admit, that's pretty doggone cool. Well, familiar sights, familiar sounds, and this place becomes even more familiar when you start to look at the herbs that carpet the ground. I love the wildflowers that you can discover here in these subalpine forests. And one of the most beautiful and dainty of all orchids is right here. This is Calypso, or fairy slipper. Now, you don't have to come to Colorado to see this little orchid. The first time I saw this orchid was in Maine. But the plants that are in this habitat, in these spruce fir subalpine forests, a lot of them have distributions that don't just cover the spruce fir forests of the Rocky Mountains, but they envelop the whole boreal region of the world, and Calypso is one of those. You can find them where spruce fir forests occur at high latitudes all the way across the globe. This is a great habitat for orchids. Right here in this patch of forest, I've seen four or five species. Things like the small northern bog orchid and the northern coral root, two very tiny flowered orchids. And it's not just orchids that we find here. You can look at any patch of ground here and really see plants like twin flower, plants that we think of growing in this habitat throughout the boreal regions of North America. And believe it or not, I never knew this until today, but there's so many calypso flowers here, I've stuck my nose into them, they're fragrant too, like good cheap perfume. And I've never seen so many. We're talking hundreds, maybe thousands, just in this little patch of spruce fir forest. At the base of the trees here, you often find deep piles of broken cones. What on earth would do this? A squirrel, the American red squirrel. This is yet another species that's found throughout North America wherever spruce and fir occur. The spruce seeds form a large portion of the diet of the squirrel. It's often conspicuous because of its loud voice. We spend the night near tree line to allow ourselves a few more hours to acclimate to the elevation. The morning brought quite a surprise.
Life's a little different at 12,000 feet. <laughs> and it only gets more ridiculous as you go up to the mountains. It, it's June 30th. It's the end of June. It's almost July. We wake up this morning and we see snow. It snowed last night. A lot of times we don't show you the rigors we have to go through to, to bring you <laughs> what you see on television. This is it. I mean, we're out here in wind chills down in the, in the teens. It's freezing. And we only go up from here. Flowers are blooming everywhere. But last night, frozen solid. Temperatures in the 20s, maybe even in the teens up top. And it's still just barely above freezing now at, at you know eight or nine o'clock in the morning. So imagine what these things have to go through. It's a really neat story to show the adaptations of these plants, yeah. but believe it or not, we gotta wait till the snow melts off of them. You know, we're struggling just to stand here and talk to one another yeah. and stay warm, but there's life thriving here in alpine and subalpine habitats. You got it. I can't wait to see more of it. Yeah, and we even had to find a sheltered place from the wind, because the wind up here, I mean, 40, 50 miles an hour, it's, it's brutal. Your nose is red. <laughs> yeah, we need to get in the warm. A few hours later, the temperature and strong sunlight have allowed the snow to melt and reveal the true beauty of the alpine flowers. It's hard to believe this is the same little alpine bluebell that we saw covered with snow and frozen this morning. It's only a couple hours later, and it just goes to show you how resilient these plants have to be to withstand intense cold, even during the summer. You know, all tundra is not the same everywhere in the world. And this is a great place to look at the different types of tundra that we see and what leads to diversity in these tundra systems. Yeah, this is very different than Arctic tundra. There's a lot of differences between truly Arctic tundra plants and the plants of the tundra here in the Alpine regions. One of the main differences is it gets cold at night here. It gets frigid, it freezes many nights during the summer here. The minute that sun goes down, it's bitterly cold. That's different than the Arctic because see in the Arctic at high latitudes, the sun's just going around and around. It's light 24 hours a day and not much difference between nighttime temperatures and, and daytime temperatures during the growing season. If you grow here, you have to be able to withstand that incredible cold that comes every time the sun goes down. There's more than just one type of alpine tundra. In fact, every single one is slightly different on every single mountaintop. And the tundra that exists here in the alpine zones of Colorado is very different from alpine tundra that you find in Montana or New Mexico, up in Canada, or even in Alaska. They're each different because they each have regional climatic differences. There's latitudinal differences that impact them and even moisture differences. But there's also differences on the sites themselves. You know, the side of the hill you're on can make a huge difference in what plants can survive. You can be on the leeward side or the windward side of a hill. And that makes a huge difference because on a windward side, all the snow's gonna be blown off and you're gonna be just absolutely pounded in the wintertime with bitterly cold winds and negative 30 degree Fahrenheit temperatures that just desiccate everything. On the leeward side, on the side of the mountain that the wind isn't blowing predominantly on in the wintertime, you get snow fields that develop and snow provides a cushion, a blanket that will protect those plants from the damaging winds until it melts during the summer. And many plants grow under snow that don't grow in exposed fell fields. And then there's the local conditions. Something as small as this rock can make all the difference in where on this slope an alpine bluebell can grow. That rock, during the winter time, you will actually have a little mini snowdrift that will form behind that rock. And it, just like the snow fields that develop on the leeward sides of the hills, will protect the plants that are here from the bitter cold. If you look just on the other side of the rock, there's nothing but cushion forming plants because right over there, it's exposed to the brunt of the wind. But here, there's a little warm and still pocket where something as beautiful as this little bluebell is able to survive. Lots of topographical and micro topographical variation on a site all work together to create the incredibly biodiverse, structurally diverse tundra that we see in the Alpine zones of Colorado. That little guy, 
is a young yellow-bellied marmot. If you think it looks a lot like a groundhog, it's because groundhogs are marmots. We just don't call them marmots in the east. Here in Colorado, we have yellow-bellied marmots, and they're very conspicuous. This large, lumbering woodchuck out here on these alpine tundra areas. And just like groundhogs, they're out here consuming a lot of above-ground vegetation. So they're feeding on grasses and, and herbs, broadleaf forbs out here. They don't stray far from their burrows. And these yellow-bellied marmots have a very cool way that they deal with living in this extremely harsh habitat. They hibernate. And if you're going to hibernate during the harsh times of the year here, during wintertime, you're going to have to hibernate for up to eight months because that's how long winter lasts here. And an animal that has to hibernate for eight months either needs to have a food reserve or they need to have a reserve of energy. And that reserve of energy for this animal is fat. So a young guy like this is going to have to double his weight just to survive the winter because they consume 50% of their body weight. And that's fat that they're using, metabolizing, to have energy to survive the winter. Hibernation isn't exactly what you think it is. They don't just lower their metabolism down and go to sleep all winter long. They wake up from time to time. Even though their body temperature has dropped lower, even though their metabolic rate has gone way down, they're still using energy. So you have to store it up, and this animal does it with fat. yellow belly marmots may look like they're not the most intelligent things up here, but this incredibly cute little animal is actually very sophisticated socially and vocally. They make a number of different calls, and they communicate back and forth about predators, about what's going on, and for territoriality. And so the sharp chirps that you hear in the alpine zone, a lot of times they're made by this very cool and very beautiful marmot. Finally, we're able to drive all the way to the top of the highest paved road in America. Well, here we are. We made it up to near the summit. Actually, we're at 14,130 feet, right near the summit of Mount Evans at the top of the road. Throngs of people come up here because it's an easy place to achieve 14,000 feet. And you get to experience just how difficult it is for those plants and animals that eke out a living up here. They're not even eking out a living, they're thriving up here. How do they do it? What do they have to deal with? Here, you gotta deal with the elevation. The sunlight that's beating down on us, it'll burn us in a heartbeat because there's not as much atmosphere between us and the sun. You don't think about how powerful the radiation is up here and plants and animals have to deal with that. Well, in addition to the sunlight, the windy conditions out here expose these plants to dryness. It blows 40, 50 miles an hour regularly, sustained up here, and winds can achieve speeds of well over 100 miles an hour. Think about what it's like in the winter at 35 below zero and 100 mile an hour winds. So windy conditions, the cold, the sun, and the oxygen. You've probably heard people talk about the fact that when you get up to these elevations, oh, well, there's thin air up there, or there's no oxygen. Well, the truth is, there's exactly the same percentage oxygen in the atmosphere here as there is at sea level, still around 21% oxygen. But the barometric pressure is much lower up here. And that means the gas molecules are much farther apart. When you get up to these elevations, your blood oxygen saturation goes way down. And you'll get dizzy, you'll get a headache, you'll suffer from altitude sickness if you don't take it easy when you get up here. The partial pressure of oxygen in your lungs is what's driving down the ability of the oxygen be absorbed into your bloodstream effectively. Now, you'll acclimate to that in a week or so, but it was kind of fun for us to use this meter that we brought with us to test our oxygen saturation. And coming from sea level up to here, we ranged anywhere from around 68 to 70% saturated up to 90, 91, 92% saturated. And that is what it's all about up here. Less oxygen in your bloodstream means you can't do things nearly as rigorously as you can at sea level. There's a whole different set of challenges here than Arctic plants and animals face. And it's just amazing to me that these creatures can adapt to all the challenges that are posed by a place like this. What's more interesting is the fact that they don't just adapt here, they don't just survive, they thrive. Mount Evans is definitely the easiest place in North America to observe mountain goats. They'll just walk right up to you almost, oblivious that you're even there. These guys are just choosing to come close to us. 
you've got the little young goat there and the one that's maybe a year or two old coming up behind and then the female here. And when you think about an animal that's well adapted to living in these harsh climates, there's very few that are better adapted than a mountain goat. This time of year, the coat on these animals is shedding and they're getting a little bit shaggy. Mountain goats have that incredibly dense thick fur that protects them against the wind and against the cold. It's frigid up here today, they're not feeling it. They're also perfectly adapted to living in these rocky habitats. They specialize in grazing in areas that are sheer cliffs where they're looking to browse on herbs and grasses. Even their hooves, made for climbing up here precariously on high rocky ledges. The sole of their feet is rubbery to give it traction. An incredible animal that's made for these kind of habitats. We oftentimes think of these as being true goats. They're not true goats. They're in a group of animals called goat antelopes related to similar creatures that live in Asia. Well, I think they're down here in this old road bed licking salts, minerals out of the rocks and the soils that are here. And that's a very important thing because they don't get enough in their diet. Mount Evans may be the easiest place to see these goats. They may not belong here. There's very little evidence that mountain goats ever occurred naturally in Colorado. And these goats here were absolutely introduced by people. So that action may be changing the tundra. We leave the craggy summit behind because we need to descend a bit to get to the real showplace of alpines. So how do these alpine plants do it? How do they put up with all the sun, the wind, the rain, the incredible dryness because of the blowing wind, the solar radiation and the cold, especially at night? Well, there's syndromes that we see in these alpine plants. Even completely unrelated species will fit a pattern just to survive here in this harsh climate. And one of the ones that has the largest flowers up here in the Colorado Alpine is this plant right here. And it illustrates very well some of the adaptations and the syndromes that we see in alpine plants. This is Old Man of the Mountain. It's an incredibly huge flower that this plant has. And that is something that transcends almost all of the barriers out here, almost all of the families of plants. Big flowers are the rule up here on plants that aren't cushion forming in the alpine habitats. And it's all about attracting pollinators. You have to stick out in a short window of time. So these big flowers are real cues for those pollinators to hone in on. And when we take a close look at Old Man of the Mountain, what we see is that all portions of this plant are completely covered with gray, silky hairs. A lot of plants up here have hairy leaves and stems and buds. And we think that's probably to be able to withstand the dramatic shifts in temperature up here. You gotta remember, it freezes at night. And if it's gonna freeze most nights or some nights even here at this elevation, you have to be able to withstand that. And having those trichomes, plant hairs if you will, all along the stem means that you're increasing the boundary layer around the tissue. Kind of the same way a mountain goat's coat, or my coat for that matter, blocks the wind, holds in the warmth, those trichomes will do the same thing. The wind out here, even though it can be cold, it's incredibly drying. And that's what's the real challenge for plants up here. Those hairs will help to increase the boundary layer and help to increase the humidity right around the stem and keep the wind from beating right up against the plant's leaves and stem tissue. It keeps it safe from the drying winds. So an incredible adaptation, even the sky pilot that's right beside me here with these blue flowers has leaves that are covered with little tiny hairs and highly compound leaves that stick straight up in the air. They fall into a syndrome. This is one strategy, but a very common strategy. The one that occurs on the most exposed slopes is just as interesting, very different. It's hard to imagine a more exposed location than this, a ridge top where the wind is continually just ripping through here, drying things out, and even blowing away the snow in the wintertime. And this gravelly and sort of rocky community where all the snow gets blown away is generally called a fell field. If you grow in such a precarious location as this, you have to really take advantage of the ground. And that's exactly what this incredibly low growing sandwort is doing right here. This plant is barely two millimeters tall and forms this huge cushion around this rock. It may be ancient, maybe hundreds of years old, and it's an excellent example of a cushion forming plant. Now, staying that low will get you out of the wind, and that's key here. 
uh, is staying out of the, the drying effect of the wind and, of course, the desiccation and the cold in the wintertime. But it's more than just that. This low growing habit also takes advantage of the heat that's provided naturally by the ground. This is a plant that actually takes advantage of natural geothermal energy. All day long, when it's sunny out, the sun is beating down on the ground and warming it up. So much so that if we look at the temperature of the ground today, when it's in the lower to mid 40s, and check the ground, we're gonna see 82 degrees. <laughs> when we look at the temperature of the plant itself, 67 degrees. So the plant is actually absorbing a lot of heat from the sun. And that's warming the plant and it's warming the ground. And at night, when that temperature plummets, this plant takes advantage of the heat of the ground to survive those cold nights. Well, a plant that's only two millimeters tall isn't gonna produce a giant flower, no matter how hard it tries. And these plants make up for not producing a giant flower to attract pollinators by producing lots of them. These cushions just become a field of snowy white when they're in flower to grab the pollinator's attention. Incredible adaptation in taking advantage of geothermal heat. Surviving the rigors of an average year here is hard enough for the life that makes its home in the Rockies. Join me next time as we delve even deeper into the ecology and into the challenges that life here faces. I'm Patrick McMillan, wishing you your own exciting expedition. When you think of the Rocky Mountains, you probably picture green valleys, lush forests, beautiful flowering alpine, a wilderness that's really far removed from our influence. But it turns out that may not be the case. Join me on today's expedition as we explore the challenges and the changes that are afoot here in the Colorado Rockies. With 53 peaks that rise over 14,000 feet in elevation, Colorado is the rooftop of America. Over 35% of the state is in public land, and most of that is in the mountains. With so much quote-unquote protected land, you might think diversity is safe here. Humans could have little impact. It doesn't take long to understand that change is a constant in nature, and our choices have impacts even here. We're headed up into the Alpine, but make a quick stop just below Treeline to visit with some of the unlikely record keepers of change, and they are trees. There's very few things on this planet that I appreciate more than bristlecone pines. They got so much character. And the thing I appreciate most about them is how weathered and tortured and gnarled they look. All of these, for instance, are beat backwards away from the west because this side's unprotected. They're growing at tree line, and up there is tundra. And the wind that's blowing down ice and desiccation all during the year is beating away this side of the tree. And you know, you have to be weathered when you're this old because bristlecone pines, they are the oldest living single-stemmed organism on Earth. And right here on Mount Goliath is the northernmost extensive stand of ancient bristlecone pines like this one. There's two species. We consider this to be different from the pines that grow in California. They used to be considered the same, but now the ones in California are California bristlecone pines, and these in Colorado are Rocky Mountain bristlecone pines. The one over in California, the California bristlecone pine, Methuselah, is over 4,000 years old, over 4,600 years old. Rocky Mountain bristlecone pines don't get quite that old, but they still push over 2,000 years. Bristlecone pines tend to grow in really rocky, thin soils that are really poor. There's not a lot of nutrients here. And the other thing about this pine is it's probably the slowest growing pine that's here, maybe on the planet. It's one of the slowest growing things, period. A year's growth on this pine may only be an inch or less. It doesn't put on a lot of height very quick, and it doesn't put on a lot of girth very quick. It takes them centuries to become a tree like we see here. But slow growth and conserving resources is really important if you're gonna grow in such an area as this. 
One of the ways you can tell this pine from a very closely related species, the limber pine, is the fact that the needles on this one have these little dots. Those are resin dots. And if you look at how long on a branch is covered with needles, that's because it holds on to those needles for year after year after year. The great thing about a tree that lives to be over 2,000 years old is that a tree like this, the bristlecone pine, every year puts on a layer of wood, a ring. And the width of that ring will tell you how good the season was that it was growing in. The wider the ring, the better the growing season, the less harsh the winter, the longer the summer, the more water was available. And so we can build a good history of what the habitat of this place was like for thousands of years into the past just by examining the rings on these trees. So much of what we know about the changes in climate that have happened in the Rockies and even over in California have to do with the rings that are laid down by this incredibly ancient tree. It's one of the great sentinels of tree line and we don't have far to go before we actually hit alpine. The very similar limber pine also grows at tree line. They tend to grow in non-random clumps. And this is tied to a surprising interaction with wildlife. The best place to see the culprit up close and personal is in nearby Rocky Mountain National Park. <laughs> Rainbow Curve here in Rocky Mountain National Park is one of the best places to see Clark's nutcrackers, chipmunks, ground squirrels, all kinds of wildlife up close. And that's mainly because they're conditioned to people. This is an extremely popular overlook. And it's the overlook I always send people to to see things like Clark's Nutcrackers. It's a difficult bird to see in most parts of the Rocky Mountains, but an extremely important species here in the subalpine areas and up into the Crummels regions right at tree line. Clark's Nutcrackers are seed eaters and they specialize on white pine species. And here up around tree line, that's either bristlecone pine or limber pine. And in Rocky Mountain National Park, it's limber pine. So when we look at the limber pine distribution around the habitat, and we notice that they all come up in clumps instead of scattered little individual seedlings, that's because Clark's nutcrackers have deposited them there. Clark's nutcrackers are capable of collecting and storing up to 38,000 seeds a year. They're going to store up those seeds all throughout the autumn period and then use them as a food reserve during the winter, the spring, even into the summer until the pine crop is ready again. They have highly developed spatial memory. They use clues and geographic reference points in the neighborhood that they live in to remind them where they buried those vast stores of limber pine seeds. And occasionally they forget or one dies and the seeds are allowed to germinate. And that's how limber pine is distributed across the landscape. Limber pine, unlike a lot of other pines in this area, does not have a wind dispersed seed. The seed is made to fit with Clark's nutcrackers. And even the genetic structure and the fact that it has that big seed has developed because of this unique association. And just imagine storing thousands and thousands of seeds and remembering where each one has been stored. Beautiful bird and especially of the Rocky Mountains. Rainbow Curve is also an incredibly cool place to see ground squirrels and chipmunks. Unfortunately, they've been entrained to come to people because people feed them here. So they'll come investigate you if you sit right here on Rainbow Curve. And the chipmunks and the ground squirrels are a really cool example of a neat adaptation to dealing with such a prolonged winter up here and, and such a prolonged season when there's very scarce food supplies. See, these animals are hibernators. We have winter chipmunks, Colorado chipmunks, the least chipmunk, and the golden mantle ground squirrels here. All of those animals really depend on storing food for the winter time, but they only use that food during hibernation. They may hibernate for six, seven, even eight months up here at these high elevations. And during that time, they lower their metabolic rate. They lower their breathing, their heart rate, everything. So they're not using as much food supply, but these little guys don't hibernate for eight months straight. They wake up every couple of weeks, kind of shiver and get back up to near regular metabolic activity. And then they'll actually eat food that they've stored in their burrows for the winter time. The chipmunks have specially adapted pouches that they just fill to the brim, fill full with seeds from the forest, subalpine forest, and even from the tundra. And that's what they use through the winter. A great way and a great strategy to deal with living in a brutal climate. Back on the slopes below Mount Evans, we finally ascend into the Alpine. But today, we're not the only ones moving upslope. 
But what we've just been able to watch here is one of the really great migrations that happens from lower elevations to upper elevations, and it's one that's hard to miss. We've been watching a group, a large group of about 100, and a matter of fact, I counted 101 elk. And this is a group of mostly cows, females, and a large number of young that have moved up from the subalpine forest up here into this beautiful alpine tundra to feed. And that happens every year here in the Rocky Mountains. It's the second largest deer that we have here. Only the moose gets larger. The males, they can get up to about 700 pounds here. An extremely large male, maybe over 1,000 pounds. The females are huge animals in their own right, 500 pounds incredibly large animals, and believe it or not, even though they're deer, they're predominantly grazers. That means they're mostly after grasses and sedges and some herbs. They'll take woody vegetation, but they're not as dependent on browsing as most deer. So really, a lot like a cow, and what a better place to be with all the grasses and sedges than the alpine tundra in that very short window when it's warm and when it's green during the summertime. So these elk, this is a group of cows and, and young, and it's kind of neat. They keep their young all sort of corralled together while they're grazing, and they all move as a unit up into the mountains to graze. But this time of year, the males are completely separate from the females and the young. They're forming their own small groups feeding up here in the tundra, and a lot of times you'll just see big bulls all by themselves. They're getting ready and fattening up, building those huge antlers that they have for the rut in the fall. Incredible to see. And you'll notice I'm a long ways away from these elk. This is the distance you want to view wildlife from. A distance that they don't notice you from. And believe it or not, it's a law. You can't harass wildlife in national parks, and you shouldn't harass wildlife at all. And harassment can be as simple as getting too close. 100 meters, 300 feet is a great viewing distance for an elk. And trust me, some of the most unique behavior you'll notice with animals comes from watching them from a distance that they don't notice you. It's not too tough to learn your songbirds up here above tree line. There's only four or five species that actually make it up here. The most common species that really loves this barren, open habitat that you see all over the place up here is the American pipit. And the pipit is a cute little bird, not the world's gaudiest species. It doesn't have a whole lot of color on it, but they're out here in the most barren of places, just foraging among the tundra grasses, the tundra plants, and even in fell fields and rocky situations. American pipits breed in the high alpine tundra area, but they also breed in the Arctic, in Arctic tundra. It's one of the few species that occurs both in the Arctic and down here in alpine tundra in the Rocky Mountains. And it loves this open habitat so much that when it leaves this habitat, because it is a migratory bird, when it leaves the tundra, it's going to go to places as far away as South Carolina. And when it gets there, it's gonna look for the most barren, overgrazed pasture you can think of, something that approximates what it's used to, it's home up here in the tundra. Aside from American pipits, we've also seen quite a few white-crowned sparrows. That's a bird that occurs in habitats from the Ponderosa pine forest all the way up here into the alpine, but we think of it as being something that breeds all the way up into the Arctic. Certainly, we've seen them all the way up as far as Nome, Alaska. We've seen several rosy finches up here. These are brown-capped rosy finches. This bird is almost entirely found in the state of Colorado. It's endemic to these high, high elevations, alpine habitats where it makes its home, and it barely bleeds over into adjacent states. By far, most of this bird's range is right here. This bird has the distinction of not just being a beautiful bird and being an alpine bird, but also being the bird that breeds at the highest elevation of any species here in Colorado. We find them breeding right up to the tip tops of these mountains. They will leave the alpine habitat during the harshest times during the winter, but they only go down slope as far as they have to, to seek enough shelter to survive. And even during the winter, they'll make forays up here into the alpine habitat. We've also seen some Wilson's warblers, just a quick glimpse in the willow bushes. So you only get those where you have structure like willows. But a bird that loves these open areas and one of the most beautiful and brilliant birds on the planet, the mountain bluebird. When it comes to bluebirds, they don't get much better than that one. Incredible bird life and uh, birds, some that you can see elsewhere, but a couple like the brown cap rosy finch that you have to come here to this habitat to really see.
The mountain specialist birds are spectacular. And it's hard to beat the dipper, a songbird that works underwater. The white-tailed ptarmigan is a bird that never leaves the tundra. The incredible extent of alpine in Colorado is evident in the distribution of this bird. And because it depends so heavily on this habitat, it's extensively studied as a potential sentinel for indicating problems due to climate change. The feathered feet are unique and perfect for walking on the snow. I think probably the only thing that's more beautiful than the alpine tundra is an alpine lake. And this one is incredibly picturesque. This is Summit Lake, and it's a famous alpine lake. One of the reasons it's so well known is that it's really accessible. Tens of thousands of people visit this site every single year. It's just below the crest of Mount Evans. It's operated by the Denver Parks and Recreation System. And this lake also is unique because it's by far the largest of Colorado's alpine lakes. It's the largest lake above 12,000 feet in Colorado at 33 acres. It may not seem huge, but it's pretty big for the type of lake that it is. See, this is what's called a glacial cirque. It's a great place to start to understand the importance of glaciers here in the Rockies. Even though there may not be glaciers today in Colorado, in the past there were. And these cirques are these depressions that were made as glaciers scoured down the hillside. And when they melted, they left behind a basin that became filled with water. And that's what gives us Summit Lake today. That's what really gives us all of these lakes that you see perched up way high in the Rockies in these U-shaped valleys. You can be sure a glacier scoured through there and left behind these incredibly picturesque little lakes. Well, as beautiful as Summit Lake is, it's not the lake itself that makes this place so unique. It's what's around it because the tundra that surrounds Summit Lake is one of the most important and biodiverse tundras in the world. One of the largest animals is causing quite a controversy because it may not belong here, and it may be changing things dramatically. One of the big issues with mountain goats is they're not native to Colorado. At least it appears they were never native to Colorado. And they've been brought in in large numbers at areas like Summit Lake here where we have one of the most fragile and one of the most diverse tundra systems. I mean, there's 150 species of plants here, many of which are found nowhere else in Colorado, a few nowhere else in North America. And we just watched goats browsing on the vegetation right here on this hillside. And you have to wonder what that's doing to the natural system here. Is it having a major impact? It's just another way choices people made in the past are having a substantial impact on this incredibly fragile ecosystem. Well, I love the goats. <laughs> I love seeing them here. It's one of the easiest places to observe them in North America. But the real hot button issue here is between the people who love the native plants, especially the native plants in the very critical area like Summit Lake here, and the people who love the goats. They both have merit to their arguments, but there's very little scientific evidence to show what the impact of the goats really is here and what a reasonable carrying capacity would be for those goats. How many can we sustain so that both the people that love the wildlife and the people that love the wildflowers could both be satisfied and this fragile ecosystem could be protected? One of the most interesting ways that scientists have been able to actually look at the impact of nitrogen deposition into these alpine systems involves these crystal clear lakes. Alpine lakes are known for that clear water, and that's because they're what we term oligotrophic. And that's just a fancy scientific term for being poor in nutrients. They have very few nutrients available, not enough to grow a lot of algae and stain the water. So in these lakes, there's a unique way that we can look at the past history of what was living in the water column and what's happening today. We can look at the changes that happened in these lakes because of a small organism that lives in the water column called a diatom. Now, diatoms have a really rigid silica body that surrounds the cells. And those silica bodies are preserved in the sediments of the lake. If we go back and look at the history of diatoms in these lakes, which tend to be stratified so that we can date them, we can push back the chronology of what was happening in these lakes for almost 14,000 years. And in the 14,000 years prior to 1950, very little change happened in these lakes. The same species of diatoms being deposited at relatively the same levels, the same densities. 
And in the last 50 years, there's been more change in the diatom communities, and therefore in the community itself, than in the 14,000 years before. The fact that we're here, that we're burning fossil fuels, is having a dramatic impact in places that would seem to be as far away from the influence of man as these pristine alpine lakes. The magical part of Summit Lake Park is the tundra, one of the most diverse in America. The low flat terrain here has allowed precious soil to develop and that makes all the difference. When you visit, make sure to stay on the trails because even walking on the tundra can do incredible damage that may take decades or centuries to repair. There's very few creatures up here in the Alpine that are more adapted to living with intense cold and living with incredible cover of snow than the pika. You'd hardly believe that this was actually a relative of a rabbit. And rabbits use their ears as one of the ways that they cool off. The highly vascularized ears shed heat. They actually act almost like radiators. And the larger the ear of the rabbit, the hotter the habitat. So when we look at desert dwelling rabbits, you notice their ears are incredibly huge. And those that are found in cooler climates are smaller. The pika's ears are tiny. And the tiny ears and stocky build mean that this creature will not shed heat easily. And it actually can overheat at a mere 73 degrees. So many researchers consider the pika to be a sentinel of climate change. And these small isolated populations on alpine habitats exist all across the West. And over in the Great Basin, where the populations are much smaller and much more isolated and have less space to move up and around, they're having big problems. Matter of fact, many populations have gone extinct and many more populations are threatened with extinction. So what's going on with Pika? Well, it may not be the excess summer heat that's causing their decline. You see, these are little farmers that store hay in these rocky talus slopes and under boulders. They stay active all winter long and they're active underneath an insulating blanket of snow. When we have abnormally warm winters or low snowpack in the wintertime, those rocky slopes are exposed. And when they're exposed, those pika are subject to extreme cold and they actually can die of exposure. The incredible little pika is a sentinel of climate change and not just change, in terms of heat in the summer, but of snow in the winter. One of the best places to get a real up close look at these subalpine birds is at picnic areas. They know because they're so intelligent that people come here to eat. And when they leave the tables just after lunchtime, great time to see birds coming in to see if anything was even left behind, even if there are no scraps. So just after lunch today, we came here and we're able to see Clark's nutcrackers and pine grosbeaks. That's one that's a little more difficult to really get a good look at. And you don't usually think of them being things that hang out around picnic areas, but they were right here, male and female, picking away at the gravel looking for scraps and um, a really great close-up look at that bird. Pine grosbeak is a bird that is tied to these subalpine areas. It feeds on pine seeds, on fir and spruce seeds. Incredibly beautiful male with a pink head and slightly less pink, a little bit grayish body, and a female with a kind of a yellowish head. Not a long distance migrant. This bird may go down in elevation a little bit in the wintertime, but not far because it depends on these conifers as its primary food source. But the other bird that we saw here, you almost always find when you come to picnic areas like this, and that's the gray jay. A lot of people call it a camp robber. This bird does something very strange. It breeds in January. Even here, it never leaves the coniferous forest habitat here, but it breeds in the middle of wintertime. What in the world is it thinking? It doesn't feed primarily on the cones of these conifers, but it stores food and they store it, especially towards the end of the year, under the bark of the conifers. And they glue it there with a sticky saliva that dries almost like super glue, holding a cache of berries and other food sources right under the bark of the tree. And the interesting thing about this is that the gray jay does not occur where the winters aren't brutally cold. The reason for that, it depends on the cold to preserve the seeds, the fruit, the nuts, the carrion that it's storing behind those bark pieces. So this is a bird that's actually very sensitive to changes in climate because if you have a warm winter, all its food source spoils. The adults may die, but you're certainly not going to raise a whole bunch of young in a winter that's really 
very mild. The gray jay is yet another example of a species that depends on harsh winters. Its fate is tied to the vagaries of climate. If you come to the western side of Rocky Mountain National Park expecting to see expansive lush forests of lodgepole pine like you used to in the old days, you're going to be pretty disappointed. This scene has been duplicated across the west, and the western half of Rocky Mountain National Park is a great place to see expansive areas, entire mountains covered with dead standing timber. Well, what killed these trees? It's not something exotic. It's not something that we brought in. These trees have been attacked by a native organism. They've been attacked by mountain pine beetles. There's over 10 types of mountain pine beetles that attack pine trees here in Colorado's mountains. But this beetle epidemic is unprecedented. A lot of people have tried to blame this epidemic on a lack of fire opening up these habitats because if there was more fire, there'd be less dense stands of pine, it'd be less of a monoculture, and you wouldn't have the problem with the beetle that we've seen here. And that does not seem to hold water. The evidence is pointing to the fact that the actual fire frequency here in the subalpine regions is the same today or higher today than it has been in the past. So if that's not the case, what is causing all the death of these trees and changing the entire ecosystem? Well, we know that the mountain pine beetles to blame, but the overabundance of beetles appears to be tied to above average winter temperatures and incredibly stressful conditions caused by drought that these trees have been facing. You see, we've had winter after winter after winter in the early part of this decade that was well above average. And when you have warm winters, you don't get the kill on the beetles overwintering phase. Then these conditions of having not enough rain and heat during the summertime stresses the trees. And when that happens, you get an explosion of mountain pine beetles that results in exactly what we see here. It appears that it's the vagaries, those wide fluctuations in the climate that we're seeing in this day and age that's allowing these species that have persisted here for so long to succumb to massive die-off. Mountain after mountain after mountain that used to be vibrant green today is standing dry tinder, and that leaves us open to catastrophic fire. The Wild Rockies are an amazing place. And the alpine tundra is an incredibly hardy, yet extremely fragile ecosystem. It draws millions of visitors a year because it's beautiful. Major changes seem to be happening here in a place that would seem to be very remote from our influence. Our choices have far-ranging implications. So remember, when you visit, even a footstep can change the world. I'm Patrick McMillan, wishing you your own exciting expedition.